Okay, so now let's look at that transmission line as a function of uh, time and in the phasor domain. Okay, I'll look at a system here. Sinusoids on transmission lines. Okay. So let's draw our transmission line. It's going to look the same as it always did. The device hasn't changed, but our excitation has. We're going to have a distance d, a velocity of propagation, and an intrinsic impedance. And let me write the original transmission line solution based on the telegrapher's equations. Forward propagating wave minus z t uh, functional shape t minus z over velocity of propagation backwards propagating wave z over velocity of propagation. Oh, and that's got to be plus sign. And where I have voltage, I also have to have current. divided by the intrinsic impedance okay this is what we learned the very first week of class and this is the generic solution now let's say we have sinusoidal excitation Okay, so I just told you that if you have a linear system, if you're exciting something with the sine wave, then everything has to be sinusoidally shaped. The phase and the amplitude can change, but I can't get anything other than a sine wave. So if my sinusoidal excitation going into the system is something that looks like cosine of 2 pi ft, then This should be what the form that my forward propagating uh, voltages take. Let's write that down here too. Cosine 2 pi, I stick in T minus Z over velocity of propagation. I take the cosine of that whole thing. Oh, I gotta have an F in there too. Can't forget that. And likewise, our G's are gonna be the same quantity. 2 pi f, that amount, t plus z over velocity of propagation. So that's with sinusoidal excitation. All I did was just assume that everything's going to be a cosine. Now, I'm going to take this into the phasor domain. Let me write this over on this board. And that's nice because it eliminates my time dependence and just gives me a complex value to track amplitude and phase. So my phasor voltage is only a function of z. It's v with a squiggle on it. And that's going to be equal to v plus how do I take things into the phasor domain? Well, I basically throw away the cosine 2 pi f t term. I take that for granted because everything's going to be that frequency. And what I have left, well, I got my amplitude out there already. My phase, the remainder of my phase, is going to be exp j and then whatever's left over. In that case, it's a minus. 2 pi z, uh, 2 pi f z over velocity of propagation. Now, in fact, this quantity here, 2 pi f over velocity of propagation, it occurs so often in uh, 
engineering and electromagnetics that it gets its own variable. So rather than writing 2 pi f over vp all the time, I'm going to write it like this. Beta z, where beta is 2 pi f over velocity of propagation. Or, you'll notice that this is 1 over seconds. f is units of 1 over seconds. This is meters per second. Here's a 2 pi. This is really radians per meter. 2 pi over the wavelength. Remember, velocity of propagation in a traveling wave formula is frequency times the wavelength of your sinusoid. Frequencies cancel, and what I get is 2 pi over lambda. Wavelength. What that really means is that's the distance along the line that you have to travel at a given instant in time to get back to the same phase as your original point of observation. So if I freeze the transmission line, I got a voltage that's traveling down the line, and it has a phase of 10 degrees over here, I got to go at least one wavelength this way to get back to 10 degrees in the next period of the sine wave. So I can write this as, a, as a minus j beta z. And in fact, if I want to, I can also, I didn't really specify this, but I can make that a complex amplitude, really. It can actually carry the amplitude and the, the phase. And this sort of represents the traveling wave behavior. Exp to the minus j beta z, a linear phase taper in the minus z direction, is in the phasor domain what forward propagation is in the plus z direction. When I go to look at my backwards propagating wave, I can do the exact same set of operations and represent this phasor with plus j beta z. Plus j beta z always means constant velocity propagation in the minus z direction when you convert it to the phasor domain. If you don't believe me, all you have to do to get back your original z voltage as a function of space and time, real value, complex voltage as a function of space, exp to the j2 pi ft. Go ahead and do that math on your own time, and you can see that we come up with our original sinusoidal expressions. Cosine and sine. Now, <clears throat> that's my voltage. Let me just write the current solution for complete completeness. I phaser as a function of space, conveniently getting rid of time, is also a forward propagating wave minus a backwards propagating wave. Any questions so far? All make sense? That's not so bad. Yeah? Oh, okay, okay. And just as an aside, if you were a physicist, how would you write this solution? You'd write it with eyes, and your eyes would have the opposite sign, right? That's a key difference between physics and, and engineering. In, in engineering, our physics, our uh, phasers, are exp minus j beta z, where j squared is equal to negative 1. In physics, their phasers are exp plus i beta z, where i squared is also negative 1, but it's the different root of negative 1. It's I is actually equal to negative j. You know, there's two square roots of negative one, a principal and then the other one. It turns out that I and j are different values. And that always confuses students when you read books because you'll see their forward propagating waves have a plus on them. Our forward propagating waves have a minus on them. In fact, if you're really uh, a mathematician or a physics uh, in one of those textbooks, You'll often see them, they don't even take anything for granted. They'll go ahead and you know, take their 2 pi f t for the ride. So their phaser actually, just to make sure you didn't forget, 
have a 2 pi FCT, uh, FT in the complex arg argument. Every single value they do in their calculation has that. It's the most redundant thing in the world. We engineers, we just like to take it for granted and just say, okay, this is amplitude in a phase. Forget that 2 pi FT. We don't need that until we convert it back to the time domain. Yeah, Anya. So in MATLAB or on your calculator, when it says I, the point of I, so it's not J value, or the I value? Yes. Okay. Isn't that screwed up? And it turns out as long as you're fairly consistent, it doesn't affect most calculations. But uh, And in MATLAB, they actually do make the distinction. They define I and the J, and oh, it's, uh, I believe so. Um, yeah, and then it'll keep that minus sign. The worst thing, and <clears throat> there are people with PhDs that write research papers and they forget the difference and they'll actually mix the notations and it screws up the result completely. So just be aware that you could be watch, looking at a paper that has both I's and J's and they've, met, they've managed to completely destroy the convention. <clears throat> yeah? So how do we distinguish the two in our calculator? The two in your calculator. Well, all you have to do is wherever you, if you only have an I button in your calculator, you put minus that, that value in all your, your values. And then when you're an, done with your complex value, you take whatever is on the I and you put a minus there. In most standard operations that we're doing, it doesn't matter, right? Because you minus the I's going in you, and you minus the I coming out of the calculation is going to be the same. But it's, it can be, where it comes into play is when you start taking formulas from physics textbooks and formulas from electromagnetics engineering textbooks and start mixing them together. You can't just do a straight up substitution of J or I. Fourier transforms are the same way. Be really careful with, if you're taking Fourier transforms from a math textbook and mixing them with Fourier transforms in a comms textbook. Not that you would ever do that. Okay, so why is this a big deal? Let's take a look at this. Let me kind of tell you phenomenologically what's going to happen over the next week. We don't care too much about echoes, at least in the conventional sense, on sinusoidal transmission lines because this is a amplitude, this is a phase, this is an amplitude, this is a phase. My resultant value at any given point on a transmission line is going to be just a sinusoidal voltage and current that are going to be some aggregate, some of the amplitudes and phase in the complex plane. Interestingly, though, at different points on that line, I'm going to get different values. Remember, as I slide down the transmission line towards the load side, this phase is decreasing, this one is de increasing. And so I've got two phasers that are rotating around the same speed in the complex plane. Sometimes they're going to add up constructively. Sometimes they're going to add destructively. Sometimes they're going to add constructively, destructively, or some case in between. And you'll find you will get peaks and nulls, resonances on your transmission lines. In fact, uh, when you have an open or a short-circuited line, you can get really big peaks and perfectly zero nulls. And that's what we're going to talk about when we come back on Tuesday. That effect is called low, uh, well, voltage standing waves. And uh, it also leads to an effect called load transformation, where the th resistor that I put at the end of the transmission line in the steady state does not look anything like the equivalent resistance that I measure at the front of the line. So we'll talk about that on Thursday.